Jesus said, You are at the door tonight. This is the study of the book of Romans, chapter 8, 1 through 14. Now, if you saw the last one, you say it's 1 through 14 also. But notice this is part two. I didn't get a chance to finish last week, so we're going to finish up 1 through 14 in Romans 8. This is episode 13. Now, the door is all about Jesus being the door. He said, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. So this is Jesus the door we're talking about. Now the Bible is what we're studying, not just any book, but the word of God. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, that's not the Bible, that's his words that the Bible is made up of, hath one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last days. So God is going to judge us by words that he's given us, words that we have written in a book, words that we can read, which are the words in the word of God. Romans 8, 1, again, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. To avoid condemnation, one must walk after the spirit. Notice the condition, conditional phrase there. There's no condemnation to a certain class of people, to those who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The implication, which will be borne out in later text in Romans 8, is that there is condemnation for those Christians who don't walk after the spirit, but rather walk after the flesh. Now that's a doctrine that is explicit, and we will see many verses of scripture to point that out to you. Notice later, when we come down to verses 12 and 13 of Romans 8, he says, therefore, brethren, so that means he's not talking to unbelievers, he's talking to Christians. We are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, for, brethren, if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. He's threatening that the Christian will die if the Christian walks after the flesh rather than the spirit. So we have a natural man who has a human spirit and he is in the flesh is the way Romans defines him as well as the other epistles. And he walks after the flesh. Notice that being in and walking after are two different things. In is about the state where one resides. Walk is about the way that one walks his daily life. The spiritual man also has his human spirit, but in addition to that, the spirit of God has come in and the two spirits have become one and function as one. So we are in, not in the flesh, we are in the spirit. That's the terminology God uses. All Christians are in the spirit. When a Christian sins, he's still in the spirit. That's Bible terminology. If you're going to understand the Bible, you must understand its terminology as it uses it. Now, a Christian that walks after the spirit, there's no condemnation. But if he walks after the flesh, he shall die, according to the words of God. <clears throat> so here is a man walking along, walking after the flesh. What do we mean by that? We mean he's walking after his natural human lust, the same lust that Christ had. He lusted for bread when he was hungry. He wanted comfort. He wanted to be praised and accepted. He wanted all the things that you and I won't. And so we as human beings end up walking after those bodily appetites and drives. That's called walking after the flesh. But then we turn and say, I'm going to walk after the spirit. And so we turn away from the drives of the flesh and seek to follow our spirit that's inside. 
You remember Romans 7 when he said, that which I would, that do I not, that which I would not, that do I? So we find that when we turn away from the flesh, that very quickly the flesh is right there again, shadowing us and wooing us with all kinds of appetites and drives and desires. And for the Christian, even for the Christian, there are times when that flesh gets in front and takes the lead and the Christian, though he's not in the flesh and he is not after the flesh, Bible terms, he can walk after the flesh. Now the natural man can walk after his own spirit and it's normal to try to do so. I went to a college, uh, art college, and my, before I went to Bible college, and there in that art college, there was a very sense, a keenness for each man to walk after his own spirit. This is back during the hippie era. And so these college professors, unregenerate men, natural men, were into philosophy and into walking after their spirit rather than their flesh. And oftentimes you saw a great deal of discipline among them. Whenever they did art, it was walking after their spirit. Whenever they did music, it was walking after their spirit. Their philosophy, when they went out into the park and sat around, drank a little wine, ate a little cheese, they tried to walk after their spirit. It's natural for a human to do that. You see, the only people that don't walk after their spirit are people like Charles Manson or some of those mass killers who have no sense of care or compassion or empathy in any way and they follow their flesh, do what they want to do, when they want to do it, any way they want to do it, no matter who it hurts. Everyone else is partly controlled by their spirit. Every man, unregenerate man, is, except for very few, are partly controlled by what they think is right and wrong. And they follow their spirit against the dictates of their flesh. They want to do something evil, and yet they don't. That's an unregenerate man. So the flesh will take the lead, <clears throat> And men try to live, you've heard the term, by their better angels. That's what an unregenerate man says. What does he mean by that? He's recognizing there's something good and something bad inside. And so men try to live by what they call their better angels rather than what they call their demons. But the natural man tends to allow the flesh to take the lead most of the time. Most men will follow their spirit when they're constrained to do so, so by social concerns. That is, they stand to lose more by following their flesh than they do by following their spirit. For what I would, Paul said, Romans 7, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. For I know that in me, parentheses, this is all scripture, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Now an unsaved man is right there in that condition. The spiritual man has an assist from the presence of the Spirit of God and is capable of an uninterrupted walk after the Spirit. This is what most Bible teachers have missed. Most Bible teachers and students and preachers have oversimplified the Christian experience by boiling it down to what they, when I was a kid, they called the black dog and the white dog that we had, each one of us. And the white dog was the spirit of God or the new nature, they called it. And the black dog was the old nature, the evil self inside. And that the determined on which one you fed as to which one dominated. So if you went to church and tithe and went to Wednesday night prayer meeting and and did all the things that you're supposed to do and confessed your sins and read your Bible a little bit, then you'd feed the white dog and he would overcome. But if you did other things and fed the old black dog, then he would overcome. That's an extreme oversimplification, which results in extreme error. And, uh, but you, can, you will see in the scriptures that it, it's an attempt to explain these realities that God explains in somewhat of a different way. So there's the New International Version on this Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there's now no condemnation. What happened? Lost part of the verse. For those who are in Christ Jesus, well, if you open your New International Version, 
you'll find that verse is missing, those last 10 words of that verse 1. It's just not there, along with hundreds of others that have been removed, and whole verses and two verses straight in a row, that have been removed from the New International Version. Now, why in the world would they do that? You know what the Bible says? Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish all of it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. He said you're not to diminish the word of God. They just diminished it by ten words. What's that mean? Revelation 22, if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of those holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now, if you're a Calvinist, that verse is not in your Bible, at least you'd rather not be. But it is what it is, and it says what it says. So if you take away from the, notice words, it didn't say ideas or thoughts, it said words. You know how many words are in the book of Revelation? I counted them. 12,000, exactly. And if you have a Bible that has less than that or more than that, then it's not the words of God, if it's in English. So there's our new international version, and it is where it belongs, in the garbage dump. Now here's the Greek, Romans 8, 1. Now I will not embarrass my Greek professor by attempting to read that for you. I didn't excel in Greek when I was in college. But there it is, that last part removed. Bible correctors protest the passage's authenticity, claiming it is doctrinally incorrect. Here's what they say. This comes out of a commentary. I went to my old library, which I don't use anymore, I use everything's digital. But I went to my old library and, and fanned the spiders off of everything. And I've got about a row about this long, literally, on the shelf of Romans commentaries. I bought, I bought every Romans commentary I could find at any time I could find it. And I've familiarized myself with the content of all of them. I did that after I wrote my own commentary. Maybe I got some of them before I wrote it. But I just wanted to know what the other guys were saying. The revised version correctly omits, this is what Newell says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Since the King James translation over 300 years ago, that's now 400 years ago, many and the best, most accurate ancient Greek manuscripts, which we have, have been recovered and earnest godly men have gone steadily ahead with tedious but fruitful work of correcting arrows that had crept in copying. For as we all know, God has been pleased <laughs> to withhold these from creatures so prone to idolatry as the sons of men. So he says God is uh, pleased to, to allow inspired scripture to pass away and be replaced with significantly corrupted substitutes. You know, there are a lot of men who are a whole lot smarter than me. I'm, I'm sure William R. Newell several times smarter than I am and much more educated and much greater knowledge. But he was an ignorant man, a man who was ignorant because he didn't have faith. He based everything on what he objectively could see and understand. Now, 99% of his commentary is pretty good. Uh, 95, 99, I don't know, somewhere in that neighborhood. It would be absolutely in agreement with what I would tell you. But there's several places he just ignores what God says. And one of those places is when he starts taking verses out of the words of God. So he said there's errors that have crept into copying. Now, how would that work, an error creep into copying? Okay, the, the average layman sees the Bible as one copy. Here it is. It's the only one copy in the world. And the scribe or Christian sits down to copy it, and he accidentally leaves out a phrase, or in this case, he jumped down several verses down, and he saw that exact phrase, which walked not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And so he accidentally copied it back into verse one, and then four verses later, he copies it again where it belongs. So an error crept into copying. That's the way he imagines it. But you know, the Bible existed from the first century in probably a hundred languages. The Peshitta, which is Arabic, 
which was spoken by the people in Jesus' day, even in Jerusalem. The Peshitta, a church, has existed there in Syria until lately, and, and it's being killed off right now. But the church has existed there with their scriptures, and they claim that their scriptures were given to them by the apostles themselves who wrote the autographs, who also made copies for them in their Peshitta language. And we do know that the Peshitta language dates back all the way to the first century because we have pieces of it. So they said errors crept into copying. Now when, you know what safeguards the scriptures? If I were to write something in here today and, and then make a uh, hundred copies of it, and there's a Spanish speaking person here and he makes a copy into Spanish and we check it and we say, yeah, that's good. That's right. Because he, he knows my English and he understands it. So we correct it. And then another one makes a copy in German and Latin and so forth. And so we ended up with a hundred languages. And then each one of us go our ways and we make another hundred copies in these hundred different languages. And then we make a thousand copies and then we make 10,000 copies. In the meantime, there are people memorizing the scripture in all these languages. And, and in some cases, one man speaks seven languages. So he reads it in all seven languages. If there's an error, a scribal error, he sees it and immediately it's excised from the text. And so the Christians in those early days, since some of them didn't have Bibles, but many, many did, they had portions of scripture. They gave themselves to reading. Meetings consisted of hours of reading and rereading. And the people memorized the scripture and quoted it and they sang it. And so if someone were singing a verse of scripture or quoting a verse of scripture out of some language and they got it in error, there are another dozen languages in an area like that who also know the scripture and can identify the error and it would immediately be corrected. So the, the scriptures were safeguarded by putting, being put in multiple languages in the same generation by people who spoke multiple languages and could read in those languages. And so it's preserved for us to this day in tidbit, uh, tidbits and pieces of multiple languages, not just one Greek text somewhere. Now, uh, Jacob, uh, I mean, uh, Abram, come up here. Uh, this, this little guy right here, uh, I want him to, to uh, do Romans. Uh, let's see. He could, start, he could start anywhere, but I'll just say Romans 8. So start doing Romans 8 for him. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh but they that are after the spirit the things of that's the that's spirit that's going all night, see? now let me ask you a question if if someone were to give you a copy of romans chapter 8 with a phrase missing would you know it Yes, sir. You, what would you do with that? I'd get rid of it. All right, go ahead. Go sit down. <laughs> I've heard him do all of six, all of seven, all of eight, and his little sister's doing it with him, you know. And uh, so that's not unusual in many places in the world. And it certainly wasn't unusual in the first century. So you tell me how an error could creep into copying. It could not. So... Let's continue. Here's Ironside, great man of God, great teacher, but a little bit ignorant in some areas. He said, a glance at the revised version or any critical translation. A critical translation, we'll talk about that more, but a critical translation is a product of Bible critics, not Bible believers, but Bible critics will show that what I am pointing out is sustained by all the editors the Bible is subject to editors. My wife writes something and I edit it. 
Sometimes she says, I don't like the way you did that. I said, well, re write it back the way you want it. And then she writes it again, I edit it. And sometimes I write something, I give it to her, and she edits it. But you know what neither one of us has ever done? We've never edited the Word of God. But there are people who think they're smart enough to edit the Word of God. And they don't even ask God's permission. And he says, it was man's innate aversion to sovereign grace, I am certain, that brought these qualifying words into the text of the common version. Innate aversion to sovereign grace? It's a Calvinist writing that. So what about an innate aversion to a perfect book? Now, he has the ability to be certain, but he's only certain of error in the words of God. I'm certain there is no error. He's certain there is. We have a difference of opinion. Now, William R. Newell's Romans verse by verse says, spiritual discernment also agrees. For the introduction of these words in verse one makes our safety depend upon our walk and not upon the spirit of God, but all in Christ Jesus are safe from condemnation as is plainly taught throughout the whole epistle. Otherwise, our security depends on our walk and not on our position in Christ. So to read the words of God, we must rely upon the spiritual discernment of men who do not agree with each other and keep changing their minds. So, you know, I have spiritual discernment, but I trust it about like I trust a bridge built out of cardboard. I may have to walk across it, but I walk very carefully. Now, John MacArthur, Romans 8, 1b, he says, is not found in the earliest manuscripts of Romans are in the most modern translations. It is probable that a copyist inadvertently picked up the phrase from verse 4 because the identical wording appears there. The meaning of the passage is not affected. Most of the Bible commentaries I read said the meaning was affected, and that's the reason they didn't want it there. They took those 10 words out because they said it changed the meaning. They said it made it look like we weren't saved by grace, but that we had to walk after the Spirit or we would face condemnation. Then he says, this is Newell again, the evidence of the Greek manuscripts is overwhelmingly in favor of the omission of the clause. Now, I'm, I'm setting you laymen free from so-called scholarship. Let me ask you, do you do you trust politicians that are really smart, really gifted, quite able, able, and tremendously informed when they tell you something? Do you trust them? No. I don't trust doctors. I don't trust lawyers. I don't trust business people. I don't trust car salesmen or house salesmen or somebody selling a boat on the side of the road. Now, why would you trust somebody just because they Put out all that stuff. Listen to what he says that the clause at the end of verse one in King James is a gloss. That means a marginal note by some copyist appears not only from its omission by the great unical manuscripts. Unical, what in the world's that? People would say, Alpha A B C D. Boy, he's educated. Look at that. F G A and D. He can do his alphabet. Corrected with some good curses in ancient versions. So you read. Uh, you read those things and you think, boy, there's some really intelligent people. I can't, how can I disagree with them? If they say it doesn't belong in the original manuscripts and they throw out all that stuff, well, I don't want to be a fool and continue to believe it's there. And so they scare Christians and back them down and they get afraid of ridicule. And many young pastors and teachers and preachers go along with it because they don't want to be ridiculed either for not going along with such wise and intelligent men. Now he said it's the the evidence of Greek manuscripts is overwhelmingly in favor of the omission of the clause. Omission of the clause. Overwhelmingly in favor. Is it? He's lying to you. Let's just put it plain. He is lying to you. You know why he's lying to you? It's because he was lied to. He was lied to by the men that he read. Now here is the traditional text, the majority text, the textus receptus, the historical text, the one from which the King James Bible comes. The Italian Bible in 1649 has Romans 8, 1 in it, all of it. 
Now these are just, this is just a representative. Of course, the King James does in 1611. The Spanish Reina Valera in 1569, predating the King James, also has that passage in it. The Bishops 1568 has it in it. By the way, these Bibles didn't come about when somebody translated them from a single Greek text. These Bibles were available in multiple languages throughout Europe for the entire 1600 years from the time of Christ until the present time when they made them. This were simply new printings, new editions of Bibles that people had handwritten copies of. When the printing press came out and they produced new ones, their name went on them because they're the one that collated the text, put it together. And then the Beza, Greek text, 1565, Geneva, Luther's Bible in 1545 has Romans 8, 1. Kramer in 1539 has it. Coverdale has it. Tyndale in 1525 has it. Erasmus Greek text has it. The Complutusian Polyglot has it. The uh, the Theophylact has it in 11th century. Uh, the P.S. Osminius has it in the 10th century. And the Anglo-Saxon Gospel 140 has it in 1000 A.D. And in the 5th century, the Speculum has it. The 5th century, Theodoret has it. And the Slavic ancient versions and Syriac and Georgian versions, up there close to Russia, have it in it as well. And the 4th century Latin manuscript predating the corrupted manuscripts has it. And then Christendom, fourth century, this is before Alpha and B. You don't know yet know what Alpha and B is, but that's the two Greek texts that they use to correct the King James Bible. Before those Greek texts came about, this is what Christendom says. This is a quote from the fourth century writer. And as to our having received more abundant help, hear thou Paul. In other words, listen to Paul. When he saith, now he quotes, there's therefore now no condemnation of them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So before Alpha and B came out, this passage was being quoted liberally and written of and preached about by ministers. And then there are thousands of lectionaires. This is a copy, a picture of one of the lectionaires, one of the nicer ones. Uh, contain Romans 8 1. Say, what's a lectionnaire? Since it was difficult to have whole books of the Bible, what the churches would do is they would print portions of Scripture, like if there's going to be a sermon out of Matthew uh, 22, uh, a parable or something, then they would take and print that whole parable out, maybe 25, 30, 40, 50 copies of it during the week, and then give them out to the congregation. And so over a period of time, the congregation individuals would, correct, would collect great portions of Scripture. And as they passed that on, there ended up being tens of thousands and millions of copies of Scripture, since they couldn't have whole Bibles, that they used to read and memorize. And so there are thousands of these around, and they have Romans 8, 1 in them. And they date through many, many centuries. And then the majority Byzantine manuscript, which uh, comes out of the area of, from Antioch north up through all of southern uh, Europe, above the Mediterranean Sea, uh, Greece, uh, Italy, Spain, all the way up to Britain, all the way out through all the Baltic states, all the way up to the edge of Russia. The Byzantine manuscript was the manuscript that produced the Bible in all of those languages from which your King James Bible comes. And so all those numbers there represent different identified manuscripts out of 5,400 and so in A.D. 150, and I remember the Bible, the last book of the Bible is written in 95 A.D. So it could, this could be older, but there's a copy, a piece of the Aramaic, which contains all of Romans 8.1, 250 years before the corrupted manuscripts they used to negate it. So here's the Nestle Allen Greek New Testament. When I went to Bible college in 1970, 1966, I think it was, the first year, I was all excited because the last several years before I went to college, I heard all the preachers correcting the King James Bible, especially where there were some passages I had a difficult time understanding. 
They corrected it based on original Greek where it made a whole lot more sense to me and made me feel a lot more comfortable. Like that one in 8 1. There's therefore now no condemnation in which in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Well, I was glad to get that out of there because I didn't always walk after the spirit and I didn't want any condemnation. And I, I believed in eternal security, so I didn't want to go to hell for not walking after the spirit. And so the preacher says that doesn't belong. I say, Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm glad to know that. But I, I've I, I was looking forward to going to Bible school where I could learn and be smart like those preachers I was hearing who were correcting the Bible. And I, I thought, boy, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll finally have me a perfect book. I'll be able to read the Bible just like God gave it in the original Greek. So uh, sure enough, I think it was the second semester, I started taking Greek. And I, I remembered after about six weeks, eight weeks into the class, I was reading, actually reading John 1, and I actually memorized it. And uh, I, was, I, was, it was, I was shocked that I was reading the original Greek. But then one day I asked the professor, I said, where did the definitions of these Greek words, because we had to remember, memorize 20 words each, for each class. I said, where do these definitions come from? He said, well, you can get them from Thayer or Weist or different places. I said, where did they get them from? He said, well, Thayer got it from so-and-so and got it from so-and-so. Where do you get it from him, him, got it from him? I said, well, who thought this up? Where's the dictionary, all this? And he said, well, it just, you know, it just goes back into antiquity. Different people have come up with definitions and they write them down and other people copy what they wrote down. And so that's where you get your definition. I said, how do we know they're right? He said, well, we don't. There, there's some differences between some people have one idea, some have another. I said, then am I really re reading Greek or am I just reading English again? Is this just a difficult way to read English? I mean, after all, uh, I, I'm taking my Greek word and I'm reading the Greek word and then I'm going to a dictionary that somebody wrote, some man wrote, that's got a definition of that Greek word and then I apply it. Only thing is there's, sometimes they'd send us to study and we'd open five lexicons or five uh, words, uh, Greek word studies and try to figure out which one of these guys were right. Me? <laughs> try to figure out which one of these Greek scholars was right. So I was pretty troubled because I didn't have a Bible anymore. It was gone. I couldn't find it. And these guys who were supposed to know where it was couldn't handle it either. They disagreed with each other, and so I was kind of confused. But it was the 25th edition of Nessel Island's Greek New Testament. But it was the Greek Bible, and that's what they told me. And so 1967, I was reading the original Greek, I thought. 1968, before I got out of Bible college, the very next year, a few important changes appeared. I'm taking this quote from a site that promotes the Bible Greek text. A few important changes appeared. Well, now, you know, I didn't know that at the time. I, I got out of Bible college before I figured that out. But in 1975, substantially different text with over 500 changes, most of which were back to the traditional text, the King James reading. So that original Greek Bible was changed 500 places, 500 words changed that were no longer part of the original Greek. The original Greek was originally different now. Are you with me? So what do I trust now? And you say, well, it's over with. Well, in 2012, they made over 30 changes to that original Greek text. They're still doing it. I have in writing where they say we will never be able to recover the original Bible. It's lost. But we do the best we can. And they make a good living off of it, by the way. So it's a it's thriving business. And there, there are somewhere close to 1,000 Bibles in the English language. You can't find them all, but they've been made, translations. Every nine months they come out with a new one. And they differ one from the other. And they're all going back to so-called same Greek text. Now, I discovered my original Greek Bible was only 69 years old. It wasn't original Greek at all. I discovered it was an invention, a recent invention in the late 1800s, by two unbelievers who consulted mediums and denied the virgin birth and deity of Christ and condoned evolution and worship of the Virgin Mary, West Cotton Hart. So look here, 5,000 Greek manuscripts from the first century, it's actually 5,400, I got 5,000 plus, and, and that's in question because there are tidbits here and there in different libraries. They're all over the world. They're stored. But the scholars have 
come up with somewhere around 5,400 Greek manuscripts have been preserved somewhere. And that represents 95% plus of all ancient Greek manuscripts. Now those manuscripts are called the received text because it's the text, the Bible we received in English, Latin, Spanish, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, Ethiopic. It's the language, it was the Bible reading the same in multiple languages that's been received by the church for 2,000 years. So it's called the received text, the one we received from our fathers. It's also called the majority text because it's 95% plus of all of the text. It was the only Bible used by the church for 1,800 years. And it's also called the Byzantine because it, it was moved north into Antioch and up into Byzantium and then spread out over all Europe all the way up into England over the first century. And it's also called the traditional text because it is the one that's been known. It's called the historical text because historically that has been the Bible. And it's the authorized version, the King James Bible, is the one that expresses that. Now, there's another one. Notice down the top, the bottom, bottom look down the bottom right corner and watch it again. It's, you'll miss it. Doop, there it is. Two percent. It's a little bitty. And uh, that's too big for representative for the size. But in the late 1800s, a couple manuscripts were found, and since then they've uncovered about eight pieces uh, that would go along with those two manuscripts. And that 2% mine is called the conceived text instead of the received text because they conceived of it in the late 1800s. It's called the minority text because it represents a small minority. It's called the Alexandrian instead of the Byzantine because all those, that text came out of North Africa. It was preserved in a monastery uh, there in one of them on Mount Sinai. And it's preserved because it never rains there and it's real dry and so it didn't rot. And also it was uh, never thought to be scripture. It was always rejected as being worthy. And so it was never used. And it's also called the critical text because the critics invented that text less than 70 years before I started learning to read original Greek. And it's also called the come lately text. It's called that by me, by the way. That's as opposed to the historical text. It's the come lately text. Now the Bible correctors promote two manuscripts from the fourth century as the oldest and the best. The Sinaiticus, which is all called, also called Alpha, first letter in the alphabet. It's called the minority text. It's called the Egyptian text. And then the Vaticanus. And it, it is a similar text with only about 6,000 differences that is preserved in the Vatican Library. And so the, the Catholic Church had these manuscripts and their Bibles were different from the reading of the traditional text because they relied somewhat on these manuscripts, but the evangelical church, the Bible believing church, never used those manuscripts. But Tischendorf in the middle 1800s went down and got this manuscript out of the uh, convent, the no one convent, a uh, place where all these, uh, where they hang out, you know, and uh, monastery, went down to the monastery and got uh, this text and then uh, discovered the one in the uh, Vatican and they put those two together and uh, came up with a brand new Bible. It's called Alpha and B, uh, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, Sinaiticus is Alpha and B, so it's the letters of the alphabet, disagree among themselves over 3,000 times in the Gospels alone. There are 30,000 changes in all in the New Testament in those two manuscripts compared to the traditional text. Alpha has been corrected to read as the traditional text. Corrections were made to it. Not all of them, but some. And when they were made, they were made to read back to the traditional text, the King James text, the Byzantine text, so forth. Okay, here is an actual picture of one of the pages of the Sinaiticus. Look at that picture of Sinaiticus, and let me go right here and get my little pointer right here. There we go. I'm, <laughs> oh, I'm cooking now. All right, notice that there's a whole line erased right there. Can you see the faint images of that line? And then down here is a, is a word erased. 
And down here is some erased, and then another writer wrote into it. And then down here is one erased, another writer wrote in it. Over here, all of this, 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 and this have been erased, and then two different writers wrote into it. Down here, all of this has been erased, and this was added to it instead. Up here, some rewriting of, the, of it was made. That is the sacred manuscripts that they use to make every translation except the King James Bible in the English language. That's the manuscript right there. That and another one like it, which is equally corrupt. Now, here's what they actually say. Let me get rid of my little pen here. I get rid of it? No. All right, my daughter's gone. Uh, <clears throat> Now, here's what they say. Codex Sinaiticus Project. Codex is like the manuscript. And so this is a very pro Sinaiticus Vaticanus corrupt Bible organization. Codex Sinaiticus says is one of the most important books in the world. Handwritten well over 1,600 years ago, the manuscript contains the Christian Bible in Greek, including the oldest complete copy of the New Testament. It's heavily corrected text is of outstanding importance for the history of the Bible and the manuscripts. The oldest substantial book to survive antiquity is of supreme importance for the history of the book. Now he calls it the book. He said it's heavily corrected. He admits that. Now he says, this is that Sinagas project, scribe B was a poor speller and scribe A was not very much better. The best scribe was D. Scribe A had made some unusually serious mistakes. Now he's not talking about all the corrections there. He's talking about the original four scribes who wrote the thing, different scribes. Scribe A made some unusually serious mistakes. Scribe A was a worst type of phonetic error. Scribe B was careless and illiterate. In the 6th or 7th century, many alterations were made. Now, this is the guys that, that support the text. It appears to be the work of a number of penmen from the 4th to the 7th century. Now, this is not anti, this is not pro-King James writers. This is the guys who support this corrupted text, and this is their brag. Now, the Wikipedia says this. The critical text is a Greek text of the New Testament that draws from a group of ancient Greek manuscripts. See that word group freaks you out, doesn't it? You can see this big, big library full of manuscripts. I'm not telling you that group is two. <laughs> a group of ancient Greek manuscripts and their variants. That's the six or eight little pieces of copies they found that went along with it in an attempt to preserve the most accurate wording possible. Other Greek texts besides the critical text used for producing English Bibles are the majority text and the Textus Receptus. That's the Greek Bible from which the King James comes. Until the late 1800s, the Textus Receptus, that's the received text in Latin, that Textus Receptus, or from received text, was the foremost Greek text from which the New Testament was derived. The King James and the New King James Version are based on the Textus Receptus in 1881. Two, now, by the way, the New King James is not based on it. It is altered to go back to the New Text. Where it's not altered, yet yeah, it's based on the King James. But where it is altered, it goes back to the corrupted text. Scholars Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton J.A. Hort printed their New Testament in Greek, later known as the critical text. This is that Bible I said was invented in the late 1800s by Westcott and Hort. Dismissing the Textus Receptus as an inferior text, rife with errors. These two guys did that. Two guys, unbelievers, dismissed the text. With special focus on two fourth century manuscripts, the Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus. As, as a result of Westcott and Hort's work, their critical text became the standard Greek text used for, two, for modern interpretation and translation for nearly two generations. The critical text was the one chiefly used for the English Revised Version 
and the later American Standard Version. Today, the updated and revised critical text, they update it and revise it, they keep changing it, is the, Greek, uh, the updated and revised critical text is the Greek manuscript basis for the new international version and the new American Standard Bible, the English Standard Version, and virtually every other modern English translation of the Bible, all of them. Though the critical text was not without its fault, okay, <laughs> it has been accepted, and that's all, it just, it, it's been accepted on the whole as being the most accurate in duplicating the original text of the New Testament, modern biblical scholars have adjusted and adapted Westcott and Hort's theories of translation. Now does that, is that not astounding to you? The depth of corruption and ignorance and stupidity? To take two such corrupted texts? Now, the 26th edition, 1978, of this Nestle Island Greek New Testament, this original Greek that was only 60 something years old at that time, the apparatus says, the only reason they omitted the last 10 words, now the apparatus is where they explain why they did what they did, the words they used, says the last 10 words was because West Cotton Hort rejected the reading. That is their, you know, what they do, they give you manuscript evidence as why they show, chose this text or not. Well, the only evidence they had in 1978 was that two men, West Cotton Hort, rejected the reading. No reason why, just they rejected it, so they threw it out. But the 28th edition in 2012 excludes that uh, admission and admits that the majority of manuscripts contain the phrase. So now, here in 2012, that this theory has been widely accepted, they'll admit, oh, <laughs> yeah, the majority of manuscripts contain it. It's kind of like the Piltdown Man in Evolution where one of the scientists got a pig's, some pig's teeth and a monkey's skull and used some acid and burned it and glued it all together and came up and, oh, I got this, this is a pills down man. And the scientific world hailed it and they created a whole new species of ancient man, the pills down man. And about 40 years later, another scientist got to looking at it and figured out it was a hoax. They all admit it's a hoax, but you know, you can still read about the pills down man and all the evolutionary books. He still exists, by the way, because once he gets to be a part of the system, you can't throw him out. It's, it's now part of the whole scheme of things. And that's the way it is with the Bible, folks. They know better now, but they're making a living at it. And so most of, most of you never heard it. You don't realize you're being taken. You don't realize this is a scam. All right. Now here's Hort, Hort wrote to Westcott. Here's what he said. Have you read Darwin? He was contemporary with Darwin. Now, how I should like to talk with you about it. In spite of difficulties, I'm inclined to think it unanswerable. In any case, it is a treat to read such a book. This is Westcott created this new Bible. Hort writes to John Ellington, El Ellerton. He says, he says, Hort writes to John Ellerton says, but the book which was most engaged me is Darwin. Whatever may be thought of it, it is a book that one is proud to be a contemporary with. My feeling is strong that the theory is unanswerable. Here's the phrase. If so, it opens up a new period. And open up a new period, it did. It did open up a new period regarding the way some scholars viewed scripture. During the 1800s, rationalism challenged Bible faith with ever-expanding sciences. By the way, I'm the author of this. By mid-century, Charles Darwin's Origin of Species met with widespread approval from the scientific community. As science supposedly proved the Bible to be an error regarding creation, there was a frenzy of glee among the skeptics and a new boldness among Bible critics to publicly challenge the inerrancy of Scripture. At the same time Darwin was pounding his theory of evolution, Tischendorf was developing his theory that the Bible is corrupted and in need of restoration. Discovering the existence of two fourth century Greek manuscripts that differed from the standard historical text, unbelieving scholars, mostly in Germany, saw an opportunity to throw open the question of the accuracy of the traditional text. Critics hailed these two texts dubbed Alpha and B, to be the oldest and best copies of the Bible. So based on their new Greek text, professional scholars came to our rescue with an alternate Greek Bible 
and, it is, and its bastard child, the revised, English revised version, published in 1881, first one. It is very different from the historical text with over 30,000 changes. 5,000 of them which are changes in words, Greek words, derived from newly created Greek text. And I have read that there are Greek words in Westcott and Hort's Greek Bible that appear in no Greek Bible, not even in Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. They, they, they took the liberty to create their own text and write it as they felt it should be written. Now, let me ask you, which do you believe? Do you believe all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profit, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness? All scripture is given? Or do you believe all scripture was given by inspiration of God, but was, has been altered in over 30,000 places? and is subject to correction by men of God who are truly furnished with a doctrine of textual criticism. Now that's tongue in cheek, but that's exactly what most all preachers coming out of Bible colleges believe today. They believe the latter. They believe, yes, the Bible was inspired originally, but it's not now. It's just a translation and it's corrupted and the best text has got 30,000 changes in it. And, and so we, we can correct the Bible because they do it every Sunday. So we believe that uh, men that we have to go to to rely upon for those corrections are men who truly furnished with the doctrine of textual criticism. They know more about the Bible than we do. So you believe one or the other. I'm going to ask you, which do you believe? God has continued to give his inspired words to his church in multiple languages from the autographs to the present, and his words will never pass away. That's what I believe. Or do you believe this? God gave inspired scripture to only a small number and then abandoned his words to the carelessness of men where it became increasingly corrupted until the 19th century when two men who did not believe it began the process of restoration, it now being understood that the original inspired text will never be restored. You believe one or the other because that's the only two alternatives. And by the way, the latter is what the majority of preachers you hear on the radio and from the pulpit believe. I like this, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, not word, not thoughts, not just a book, but the words composing that book shall not pass away. Don't you think a God who's powerful enough to inspire uh, Paul to sit down and write a book and it come out to be God's words is also powerful enough to make sure that it stays protected and preserved down through the centuries? What kind of God have you got? Now back to our text, I cannot believe I'm back in Romans A1 again. All right. I'll tell you what I'm going to have to do. I'm going to have to go ahead. And so next week we'll go through the text again because uh, I took longer on that than I thought I was going to take. All right. So uh, I guess as uh, Bugs Bunny said, that, that that's all, folks. <laughs> Thanks for studying God's Word with us. You can follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Vimeo, and Twitter, or contact us by email at thedoor at nogreaterjoy.org. The Door is a production of No Greater Joy Ministries. For more of Mike's teachings, as well as hundreds of other great resources on child training, marriage, family, and faith, go to nogreaterjoy.org. While you're there, download Mike's free audio teaching on Romans, and check out Mike's award-winning graphic novel, Good and Evil, now available in over 48 languages and as an animated video. See you next time at The Door.